Good morning. We're doing this again over the over the internet, and so we'll make the best of it. Um, I'd rather be with you guys, and but it's it is what it is. So let's go ahead and and uh, get started this morning. We're going to look at the triumphal entry. Now this is the beginning of Holy Week, leading up to the crucifixion and resurrection, and so this this uh, this event is recorded in all four Gospels. So it's a very important event in uh, Jesus' ministry, and it's the triumphal entry. It's in Matthew 21, 1 through 11, and it's in Luke uh, chapter 19. We'll be reading a, a verse from there too. So let's go ahead and pray uh, together as we get started. Uh, Lord, I thank you that uh, we can come to you as, as your church family. You know our needs. You know what we're going through. You know what we need even today. Lord, so I pray that you would, you would supply this through your word for us. I pray that you would uh, speak to us, Lord Jesus. Help us to worship you um, even more uh, today as we uh, as we read your word and this week as we look at the Holy Week and follow your steps, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, so let's get started. Um, today we're going to see a city, a crowd, and a donkey. These are all important things that we're going to look at in, in this event. What is the, why is it called the triumphal entry? It goes back to Roman times when a Roman general would go and conquer a, another place and he would come back and they would have this ceremony, a big procession. The general would come in, crowds of people around him, come into the city victorious. Um, it, yeah, decisive victory won over a foreign enemy. Uh, maybe like the parade in Kansas City after the Chiefs won the Super Bowl. So that's where we get the word, and today we're going to look at both triumph and tragedy. This is the city. It's Jerusalem. You might recognize that. It's a very ancient city. A couple of names for it in the Bible are City of David and Zion. <clears throat> Jerusalem's history. This is a very significant city. It is significant because Yahweh chose this city, God chose this city as his divine, the center of his divine kingship. So David was the one that he put on his throne, and he told David a great promise back in the book of Samuel. He said this, David, there will be someone on the throne over my people forever. And this person forever will be from your lineage. And so a great promise to David and a great importance over the city Jerusalem. What about Jerusalem's future? What about this city that's thousands of miles away from us? What, what, is, it, what is important about it? The future, Isaiah chapter 2 says, that this will be a place where the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established. It will raise above all other mountains and the nations will stream to it. The peoples will come and they'll say this, Let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, we may walk in his paths. And the law will go forth from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between the nations and will render decisions for people. I like this last part. Never again will they learn war. This is a picture of the future and how Jerusalem will play a key role as a city for the nations. It's very interesting there. Um, I, I likened it to this city um, in Poland. The city is called Wroclaw, and this city is a beautiful city with lots of history, beautiful buildings. But in 1945, this picture was taken of, of the city. You may not be able to see it, but it's of buildings that are partially, if not totally, destroyed. Why were they destroyed? They were destroyed because of the occupying force, that of Nazi Germany. So all of Poland was occupied by Germany. Now, the same for Judea, for Israel, back in Jesus' time. The Roman Empire was spanned a lot of different countries, including Jerusalem and Bethlehem, Judea, right here. So this was their picture. I think we're kind of being occupied now by this coronavirus. I'm in my basement doing this. You're at your house 
uh, listening to this all because of this virus that has overtaken the whole world and we know it's for the good that we have to stay home and 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 stop the curve and so but the thing is what if this was a occupying force what if this is another nation coming in making us not uh, be able to go to church and not be able to go to school and and different things like that man I guarantee you we wouldn't be happy about that at all and so we the the same for those in uh, Jerusalem and Israel they were not happy at all about the Romans occupying them with their with their false gods and their and their cults and that so history of Jerusalem city of David future city for the world and the present time during Jesus it was ruled by the Romans a little bit more into the history of, of uh, Jerusalem of Israel now the city of David I want to go back and talk about King Saul and there's a deeper problem going on with Jerusalem there's a deeper problem with Israel than this occupying force of the Romans and we can look at it back in 1st Samuel now Israel had problems then they had other nations around them bigger nations stronger nations they wanted a king and they wanted a king that would be like all the other nations that he would be a king over us to decide different things for us and to go before us and fight our battles we want a king up there we can see we want somebody that looks like a good king somebody that's like the other nations a strong man a military leader but we want this but the problem is this, that God did not have this for them at that time because God was their king. And the problem was they were wanting to look for a king that fit their own expectations. And so they refused to listen to Samuel, God's prophet. Now, what does God say to Samuel? Listen to the people, for they have not rejected you, Samuel, but they have rejected me from becoming king over them. This is kind of telling about Saul's appearance. He was a choice and handsome man. There was not a more handsome person in all the sons of Israel. His, from head and shoulders, he was head and shoulders taller than, than all of the people. Israel rejected God as their king because they were looking for solutions to their problems and God didn't fit their expectations. Now, King David, the city that is named after the city of David, okay? So Samuel, God, rejected King Saul. Saul's heart was not right with God. It was not right towards God. It was not right towards the people. He was not the man to lead God's people. So. God tells Samuel, go to the house of Jesse and anoint the king there. So Samuel goes into Jesse and he has his sons lined up and he enters the house and Eliab was the first in line. So Samuel thought, hey, here he is. This is surely the Lord's anointed. This is the one God's going to choose to be over his people. But God said this, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Samuel's like, look, all your sons. Nope, God hasn't chosen him, him, him. Nope, Jesse, is there any other ones? And Jesse's like, well, yeah, there's the youngest. He's out in the, he's out ten in the flocks, though. I'll go get him. So the youngest comes in, David, and God tells Samuel, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. The Spirit of the Lord came mildly upon David from that day forward. The city of David, this is Jerusalem, the city of the great king. And so we see in Israel an issue. We see in Israel a rejection of God's help, a rejection of God's rule over them, I want to keep on going. Now, as we return to our event that happened, the triumphal entry, we see crowds. We see, first, that it's coming from the healing of Lazarus. Not just healing, 
but raising a man who was dead for three days, bringing him back to life. Word spreads like wildfire about that. How does word spread so fast about something like that? It happens. We would know that really fast. Another thing is Passover. Passover, it was going on, it would double the size of Jerusalem. There would have been about 100,000 people in the city uh, during, during that time. Anticipation of the Messiah. So right now, we are anticipating this virus maybe coming here to Montauk County. But I wonder if you guys have heard um, of, uh, of Ronnie Ratcliffe. He's a guy around here who, who tested positive a couple weeks ago. And I bet, I don't know if you guys heard that, but I think words spread like wildfire about um, this, this man, Ronnie, um, having, having the virus. And so um, it's, think about it like that. Maybe you guys have heard of that. But like back then, it would have been this. We got the Roman occupation, and here is this man. Who is he? His name's Jesus. He's the prophet from Nazareth. Okay, he just healed Lazarus. He just healed this man, Lazarus. He brought him back from the dead. And I hear he's coming into the city today. Whoa, let's go meet him. Where's he going to be at? The anticipation of this man that could be the Messiah, this leader that's going to lead Israel into a revolt against the Romans and rescue them from Roman occupation. Crowds. So I want to look at these um, war leaders here for a minute. Ulysses S. Grant, I don't know if you can see this or not, but Ulysses S. Grant was a great military leader in the Civil War. And he was riding here and depicted on a horse with his sword drawn. What about George Washington, a great military leader in the Revolutionary War, first president of the United States. Here he's pictured riding on his white horse. Look at Napoleon. Kind of a cool picture. Napoleon was a leader of the French Revolution, and he is riding on his white horse also. Look at Alexander the Great. Man, this guy here, he's charging with a spear and he, on his horse, and he's going after him. Now, what about the Messiah? We, we, we come to this in the triumphal entry. We, we come to this expectation. We come to this, um, this anticipation of the Messiah. And so I want to see it here in Matthew 21, 1 through 3. As they approached Jerusalem, he sent two of his disciples, Jesus did. And he said to them, go into the village, and you're going to find a donkey and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says to you, you know, this, this or that, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. So, so he gives them these instructions on on what to go do, and they go do it. They go do just as he said. And they brought the donkey and the colt. They lay their coats on the donkey, and Jesus gets on the donkey and proceeds to ride the donkey into Jerusalem, into the crowds that are anticipating the Messiah, into all the celebration that happens. The palm leaves cut and laid down, which is a symbol of what national nationality the the palm the palm branches and Jesus is riding in into Jerusalem so imagine like the Roman leaders like whoa this crowd and all this and patrolling and who are they looking for this man Jesus they're they're, they're cheering <clears throat> cheering for him and here he is he's riding in on a donkey are you kidding me this is who they're cheering for <clears throat> a donkey was not exactly a war horse more like a pack animal you pack your stuff that you don't want to carry. You put it on the donkey and you pack it. He packs it for you. And here he is, Jesus, riding into Jerusalem on this donkey. Now, this takes place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. This is in Matthew 21, 5. So the disciples didn't get this at the time, but looking back on it after Jesus' resurrection, they understood. And so they, they, he, he gets on. And I'm going to read this here in a minute, but not, not right here. So, Zechariah 9 is where this is from. Zechariah 9, the beginning of that chapter, my study Bible has this as the heading, the victories of Alexander the Great. So apparently this was fulfilled in Alexander the Great con conquering of the known world. And here we see Alexander the Great on his horse, which is, which is fixing to trample this guy here. But right in the middle of Zechariah chapter 9 is this prophecy. 
Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey. Look at these words as we just pause to look at this prophecy. Your king, Jerusalem, your king is coming to you. He's just, he's endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey. The tragedy we see in this is spelled out for us in Luke chapter 19. I'm going to read that. Luke chapter 19, verse 41. This is Jesus speaking. When Jesus approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept. All the crowds cheering. Jesus is weeping. If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they've been hidden from your eyes, he talks about, in A.D. 70, 40 years later, how Rome was eventually going to crush Jerusalem. The days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will level you to the ground and your children within you, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Not just with Jesus, but Israel had a history of not recognizing God. And it culminates in this, when God came and he walked among them and they rejected him. They missed God again and they would pay the consequences. They didn't know God because they expected something different. And they rejected him again. This brings us here to a few conclusions. Suffering. Jesus talks to his disciples. We'll see later on in the week, but he's about to be arrested. His disciples were going to flee. But before this happened, Jesus told them it was going to happen. And he said this because that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Why do we have tribulation in the world? We, we oftentimes want to have the perfect family. We want to have the perfect health. We envision, we expect, we expect perfect kids. We envision and expect a perfect spouse. We envision a, a, a great job. We envision our jobs will last. We envision these things, and then when they don't happen, these expectations crumble down, don't they? And I'm speaking to many of you guys here that are, are going through some type of suffering right now, going through some type of difficulty, going through some type of, of just being, being confronted with Things that have not gone the way you expected them to. And so as Jesus goes into this city on this donkey and the crowds are expecting this and they're underneath this Roman occupation. I wonder if it's something that we need to talk about now that this suffering is in the world because of sin. That it's sin. It's sin against God. It's my sin, it's your sin, it's the world's sin that causes suffering. And it's this sin that is, that is, the, it, it, is the, it is the disease that humanity has. And sin is evil. And sin is not to be messed with. And so we'll, we'll go on, but in the world you will have tribulation. Don't be others that sin against you. Sin against others, and in this world is tribulation, but he says this, I have overcome the world. I've overcome it. Let's look on. So in this suffering, he is in control. I don't think it's by accident that, this, that, that the gospel spends so much time that the details of Jesus saying, okay, go into this other village, you'll find a donkey. Go get that donkey. If someone gives you a hard time, tell them this, and then they'll let you, and then bring the donkey. And they do exactly what he says. They encounter exactly what he said, 
and it goes as he said it would. He is in control. He is deliberately walking into the suffering of the cross. He deliberately is walking into it. And he's doing it for you and me. He's doing it for the world. John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is doing it and he's not surprised. He's not surprised. He's not surprised about it. And guys, he's not surprised about what you're going through. He's not surprised about the suffering that's come on in your life. He's not surprised about it. He, in fact, he is, he is in control and honestly, maybe, he's deliberately taking us into these times so that we can know that he is going to walk with us through it. He's going to walk with us through it. Triumph. We see the tragedy of Israel rejecting Jesus. And now we see the triumph. Look, Moses revealed the law. The law was revealed through Moses, but John chapter 1 says grace and truth were revealed through Jesus Christ. Now, this story, this event tells us about God. What do we learn about God? We learn, number one, that God is humble. He is humble. And we have seen this over and over in Jesus' life, especially at his birth. How Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Jesus was not born in Jerusalem. Jesus was not born in a great city of the world, in a great palace, but you know where he was born. He was born in an obscure town like Latham and Clarksburg and High Point and Bethlehem. And he was born in not even a house, not a hospital. He was born in an inn. He was born in where a cattle eats hay. A cow eats hay. And he is humble. He is humble. And so he, he's coming into Jerusalem on this donkey, showing them that God is humble. That God is love. That God is love. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's agape, it's agape love. It is love that says, I'm going to seek the good of another, no matter what it means for me, and no matter what their response is, this is God. This is God. He's humble. This is who He is. This is, and they didn't know it. Israel didn't know it. They didn't know Him, and, and this is who He is. But then this, He's just. There's a consequence for Israel rejecting Jesus. There's a consequence for a rejection of the salvation that God offers in Jesus. And his consequences will fully be realized when we meet God someday and we meet him without Jesus. We meet him without the covering of his sacrifice. And he sends us to a place called hell where our sins are punished forever. Our sins against his glory. But, but, we don't have to because God has sent his son to cover our sins. And so here we see this mercy before justice. Mercy before justice. And we see God riding in to his city, Jerusalem, king of kings riding in on a donkey and showing mercy before uh, justice. So in a Revelation, no, this is in Isaiah actually, uh, no, this is in Revelation, sorry. This is Revelations where we do see Jesus coming on a white horse. And he is called faithful and true. He has, he, he, he judges and wages war against the nations. On his head uh, is a crown with many diadems. And, it, and his eyes are a flame of fire. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. And on his robe and on his thigh are written this King of kings and Lord of lords. We see this justice that will come to humanity because we've sinned against God. But we see first mercy. This same king who will come on a white horse came and rode into his city on a donkey. I'm going to close with this. Why is it called the triumphal entry? Jesus has triumphed over sin and death through love. He didn't come on a war horse. He came on a donkey. 
with a heart full of love for you and me, who just like Israel, we have rejected him. Just like his people, we have rejected him as king over our life. He has won the victory over our pride through his humility. We just think about God in this way, that he is humble. That he has come to, to take everything that we can throw at him, Everything that we can throw, and he can, he has come to take it upon himself. He has come to die for the penalty that is due to us because of the sin against him that we have done in our lives. Jesus has taken the lowest spot so we can worship him truly. The highest prize in this life is to know Jesus and to love him and to serve him. And he has taken the lowest spot so that we can worship him. And so as we just close out today, just a few things like just to worship Jesus this week in mindful of the price that he's paid to meet our greatest need. Maybe there is illness in your life. Maybe there's suffering in your life. And we might look and see, man, Lord, would you take that away from us? In his mercy, he may do it. He may heal us. He may, but the greatest need in our life is a healing between us and God, a reconciliation between us and God. And that can only happen through what he did on the cross. He came and laid his life down. And this week, that's what we're celebrating. We're honoring that. So as we read through the scriptures this week, think about the humility. Think about the words he speaks. Think about what we know about God through what we, we see. The last thing is this, as we think about others in need, who needs your love? Who needs this kind of love from you this week? A love that doesn't seek justice first, but shows mercy. Who leans out in mercy for those that don't deserve it? A, a love that seeks the good of another, regardless of the consequences to themselves and regardless of what that other may do in return. And we see that in God. And so let's pray as we close out. Lord, thank you for this word. There's much more that we could say, and we're going to look into your word. I pray that you would, I pray that you would instill this in our hearts, that you are our Savior, humble, merciful, but you also are just. And this justice is shown in the book of Revelation, and to come. But first, it's your mercy. We praise you for it, God. We're in need of your mercy. We're in need of your son, Jesus, and we thank you for him, Lord. We thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.